Welcome back, everyone. So this week, um, well, actually, this um, these first two video lectures, not even the whole week, we're going to start talking about emotions, aggression, and stress. So this will give us a nice um, summary of what emotions are, and it'll be a nice segue into psychopathology, which we'll pick up after um, these two video lectures. So what are emotions? We all experience them, and thus we know them, but it's sometimes hard to define them. Even when you looked it up in the encyclopedia, we're left with naming emotions instead of really describing what they are or how they affect us. Thus, perhaps the best way to define emotions is through looking at their effects. Um, how do we experience them? So, feelings of emotions are subjective and they vary from person to person. There are differences in strengths of emotions that are also seen throughout the lifespan. Um, for instance, older adults actually have better emotional regulation than younger adults, so they're able to better control their emotions and control the, um, the strength of the emotions that they feel. So, feelings are a very important aspect, of course, of emotions. Actions um, also play a role. So, of course, with um, emotions, you may be laughing or crying. And these behaviors also affect our, um, our emotions, what we our experience, but also, um, as you can see, emotions also affect our behavior in these ways. There's also physiological arousal. This is where it gets tricky, because the arousal, um, the physiological arousal that you have is very similar between different emotions. However, what is the same is that stronger physiological arousal is associated with stronger emotions. We'll talk about this a lot more because a lot of the theories of emotion um, relate to that physiological arousal. Lastly, motivation comes into play because we are motivated to seek pleasure and to avoid pain. Thus, we will work for things that result in positive emotions, and we can also be punished by things that result in negative emotions. So, since we discussed um, physiological arousal's impact on emotion, this raises the question of which comes first, the emotion or the physiological arousal? So the full knowledge says that you know, when a stimulus occurs, people would first interpret the situation and then the emotion would follow. And lastly, the autonomic arousal. So if you saw a bear, you'd interpret this saying, okay, that's dangerous. And then you have the fight or flight kicked up because of that interpretation. However, James and Lane both at the same time came up with a very different theory. And that is that the arousal actually precedes the emotion. The arousal comes before the emotion. Um, although there are several new theories that in have some ways surpass this theory, um, though if you ask my wife, she still loves this theory. Um, it's still very influential and it brings up a really important aspect that the arousal is extremely important to um, to look at when studying emotions. We um, now know that the strength of an emotion is highly dependent upon the strength of the arousal. So the arousal isn't merely a result of the emotion, it, it's an active player in and of itself. Also uh, related to this, an interesting fact is that individuals with spinal cord injuries who have less arousal also have blunted emotions. So again, it shows that arousal isn't just a side effect of an emotion. Arousal plays a significant role in um, determining the strength of the emotion and some would argue maybe even the emotion that you feel. Cannon and Barr developed their theory in opposition of the James Lane theory that we just discussed because they believe that since autonomic um, changes take time to occur, that the emotion likely begins long before one's autonomic response is ramped up. Further, they argue that the autonomic arousal is virtually the same regardless of the emotion, and thus it almost seems to be an independent piece of the puzzle. So therefore, they postulated that arousal and emotion come into the picture at the same time, and that it 
one's interpretation of the situation is what determines what emotion is experienced. So here, the cerebral cortex decides the emotional response, and then it activates the sympathetic nervous system. Similar to Cannon and Bard, uh, Stanley Schachter also thought that cognition played an important role in emotion. However, unlike other models, uh, Schachter viewed this as more of a feedback loop that incorporated the fact um, that stronger arousal will lead to stronger emotions and that the emotion we feel will impact our interpretation of a situation. So. With that, Schechter's agenda was to show that cognition really drove a lot of this process. So to show this, he had people come into the lab and gave them epinephrine shots that would cause or physiological arousal. Individuals were either told that the shots would be told what the shot would do, or they would not be told what the shot would do. And um, what ended up happening is that those who were um, told what the shot would do, expressed no change in emotion. But those who were unaware often had a new emotion that matched the confederate in the room. Uh, so with this, the thought is that the cognition impacts the emotion. However, critics have argued that it isn't true that arousal is nonspecific, and research has shown that there are some differences in arousal between emotions. So now that we've discussed some of the theories of emotion, we get to the other question, which is, how many emotions are there? Um, certainly, you can imagine this is a difficult task because of the subjective nature of the emotions that we, of, that we have. But there are several good um, theories out there to talk about. So Pletchik suggests that there are eight basic emotions, and they're in four pairs of opposites. So you have joy and sadness, affection and disgust, anger and fear, expectation and surprise. And what you can see is that with different levels of intensity, you have variations of this. So you have ecstasy, um, which is part of the happiness, or uh, you can have rage, which is part of annoyance. It all depends on the level of intensity of the emotion. So just stop and think about this for a second and ask yourself, what do you think? Are there any that are missing? What about contempt and embarrassment? Are those emotions? Well, Paul Ekman disagreed. Uh, instead of, I'd, instead what he did, um, which is really interesting, is he identified eight expressions. And the theory um, essentially says that these expressions can be found across many cultures without training. So suggesting that these emotional expressions may be innate. They may just be part of being human that we we show these expressions. And thus maybe the maybe that's the way to decide how many emotions there are. So that's an interesting thought. What do, what do the data say? So while there is significant agreement across cultures, one problem we run into is that isolated, illiterate groups seem to define fear and disgust differently than Westerners. Each group looked at pictures in the study, and they were asked to pick the emotion that was being displayed. And the white bar on these signifies chance. So what you can see is in the isolated, uh, non-literate groups, some of these, like surprise and disgust and even fear, some of these are not very far above chance. So certainly much less than what you see in the Western literate group. So this tells us that there may be some acculturation effects. Um, culture may play a role with um, what emotions we are able to recognize and what emotions we display. Now, that being said, you do overall still have a fair amount of overlap with these. So it's still, there's a lot of this that looks to be potentially innate as well. So how do we make these expressions? 
Well, there are actually two sets of facial muscles that make this happen. First, there are the superficial facial muscles, and these attach only to the facial skin. They are responsible for small, precise movements, like changing the shape of one's mouth, eyes, nose, or raising one's eyebrows. The deep facial muscles are below, connecting to the bone, and they're responsible for large, drawn movements, such as uh, chewing. The muscles are served by two cranial nerves, the facial nerve that instructs the um, facial muscles and the trigeminal nerve, and this instructs the deep muscles. The sides are also controlled separately for the lower two part, two thirds of the face, so roughly from here down, the sides are instructed differently. And then for the upper third, the information um, comes together, so they're not separate for the upper third of the face. So this is why, for many of us, it's hard for us to raise just one eyebrow. We can do it, but it's not, it's not overly easy. Whereas it may be easier to move one side of your face and not the other. It's because you do have that differentiation by side for the lower two-thirds, but not the upper third. So facial feedback actually really affects communication more than you think or well I don't know what you think but more than I would think at least um, so I actually had an experience of this where I was doing therapy with someone with Parkinson's disease and with Parkinson's much like you can have with schizophrenia you can have a very flat affect where the person just has very little facial expressions and it was really difficult to do um, to do therapy with this individual in large part because I wasn't getting that facial feedback that I normally got. So for instance, it's hard for me to know whether the person was serious or joking uh, because I didn't have those facial cues and I also didn't have a lot of auditory cues from him. So with that, um, it does limit social interactions and it does make it harder for others to interact with an individual if you don't have these facial expressions. There's also Bell's palsy, and this is caused by a virus and can cause partial facial paralysis. So that's what you can see here. And um, it usually remits on its own after a few weeks or months, but it can also cause impairment um, with expressing emotions because people aren't able as easily to determine what emotion you're feeling based upon your face and your facial reactions. So when do these emotions develop? We know that some are present by birth and they actually come pretty quickly. So at birth we have three main emotions, interest, contentment, and distress. After three months we add on some more emotions. So at three months we bring on excitement, joy, happiness, sadness, and disgust. Between four to six months, we start developing anger. At six months, we get the emotion of surprise. And between seven and eight months, we start um, being able to experience fear. So after we're a year old, around months 18 to 24, so later in the first year, um, going to being two years old, we start getting self-awareness, which leads to a couple more emotions. We get um, embarrassment, empathy, and also envy around 18 to 24 months. And then between years two and three, we start getting these evaluative emotions, where we evaluate ourselves with others. So these are um, emotions such as pride, guilt, regret, and shame. So you can see that while some emotions are present at birth, they really do develop as the child develops over the first two to three years of life. Lacey and Lacey's theory of um, individual response stereotypy is essentially that there's a tendency of individuals to have the same response patterns throughout their lives. So let me explain this a little bit more. 
So this theory refers to a pattern that occurs among some individuals who tend to react to various kinds of stress with increased activation in a specific physiological system. And the thought is that each body system shows a distinct pattern of reactivity that are specific to that individual, and these responses are elevated in certain individuals. So with that, some people just react more to emotions than others. So for instance, infants who are high reactives um, to stimuli with extremely, especially strong reactions, are more likely to be shy and also may have more phobias and fear responses later in life. So thus, these responses tend to be trait variables that are fairly stable across the lifespan. 